Program Committee, and it is my pleasure to welcome you to this first holiday program of the fall season. And we are trying an experiment today. We are doing what we're calling rapid reviews. And there are a couple of people in the audience who are actual librarians or retired librarians who may have been to uh, rapid review sessions at the Vermont Library Association. And the idea is that our esteemed colleagues here will very quickly review, each of them will review 10 of their favorite books. Um, some old, mostly new. And did you all get a bibliography? No. No? Um, but don't worry, Michelle will pass it up. Because I do whatever Grace does. <laughs> so and you should each have a bibliography, and then you can make notes on it if there's something that you really like. Michelle, George needs one. Here. Oh, good. Good. Excuse me while I want. No, you need Oh, yeah, I, I would expect nothing less. So um, before, I, before I introduce our speakers, I would just like to make sure that you, that many of you are regular Ollie attendees. Some of you, I think, may, it may even be your first time. But we do have a program every Wednesday at 1.30 here at the Montpelier Senior Center. And if you do not have a program, those beautiful orange brochures right over there uh, will tell you everything that you need to know. Well, not about life, but <laughs> about all. Um, so next week, without a bike, she's next week, I believe, it's an Amy program. <laughs> this is Amy Ehrlich. Um, next week, we're having representatives of Surge. Oh my God, I thought it was a spider. Jesse George. <laughs> well, why would you pick that? So next week we're having representatives of Surge, which stands for Showing Up for Racial Justice. And the topic is White People and Racial Justice, How the Fight Against Racism is Our Issue Too. So that should be a very interesting presentation and discussion. And we have all sorts of other programs after that. We have, we have history, we have politics, we have the environment, um, and, and art, et cetera, et cetera. So I'm hoping that you can come to a lot of them. As you probably know, it's $40 for the whole session or $5 um, for each one as, if you come in. If you don't come in, you don't have to pay a thing. <laughs> yeah, so we try to make it easier for people. So, so we have two booksellers and two librarians, and some of you will say, but wait, but wait, one person is both. And yes, that would be George Spaulding, who works full time at the library and quite a lot at the bookstore. We don't know how he does it all, but I noticed that almost every single person that came in said, hello, George, <laughs> because they know him. Now, Steve Picasso, you've seen by seen at the library, he is the head of circulation. He is quieter than George. Oh, what a surprise. <laughs> but also a great guy. Um, and then we have our two booksellers, Cora Kelly and Claire Benedict. And I hope you are also patrons of Bear Pond as well as uh, Keller Covered Library. Now, in the the bibliography is, of course, in alphabetical order by author because guess what? I'm a librarian and there's no other possible way that I could have done this list. Um, so there's going to be popping up. Um, so for instance, George, you see that the first, the first entry has George's initials after it, GS. And so if you have any questions about any of the books that they're talking about and you can't remember afterwards, who mentioned them, you would do have the initials to refer to. So we're, we're, they're going to be popping up, doing the books in order that they appear on here. There is no relationship between one book and the next, other than the fact that they each book is liked by somebody here. Um, we have a PowerPoint that is the covers of the books that they're talking about. So if you don't want to stare at them, you may also stare at this. Um, are there any questions before we start? Everybody ready? Are you excited? <laughs> okay, guess who's first? 
Uh, I'm talking about the first book, which is Real Queer America. The, the author of the book is a reporter who was formerly a fairly conservative straight reporter who discovered she was a woman. Um, and she made it a point to travel the United States for a couple of years after the recent much lamented election to go to different areas that voted red in 2016. Uh, places like Utah, Salt Lake City, uh, Indiana, Bloomington, Fort Wayne, Texas, the Rio Grande Valley, to talk with people that were there. Uh, they were queer in various ways. Uh, she saw a ton of drag shows because drag apparently translates everywhere. She also talked with a bunch of people who were immigrants uh, who were living in the Rio Grande Valley and that made that chapter great and also heartbreaking. I would really recommend it. It's well written. She doesn't lament too much and the people she meets are fascinating. Uh, this book is The Mothers by Britt Bennett. Um, the Mothers is set in modern day California and it revolves around a church community complete with a meddling set of ch church elders, which are some of the mothers of the title. And but it's mostly about a teenage girl who's reeling from the recent suicide of her own mother. And she's heartbroken <coughs> and damaged, but she's also a very strong character. And she takes up with the pastor's son in one fateful summer. And um, the mistakes that she and the young boy make that summer kind of stay with them throughout their lives and reverberate for many years hence. Um, the, uh, oh, sorry. Um, so there's lots of themes about motherless children and the mother-child relationship throughout the story. Uh, Bennett's characters are beautifully written, nuanced, and very real. And one of the things I loved about this book is that it takes place around an African-American religious community. And the, the focus is neither on religion nor race. Um, it's just facts that um, just happen to be. And um, <laughs> you can tell these incredible stories without uh, it being a racial story or a religious story. And I uh, highly recommend it. So of all the books that I recommended, this was the one I was most excited about. I was counting down the days until it was actually released. Uh, the author has been a television writer for some time, and this is his first work uh, of literature. Um, so it's a collection of short stories, and um, what I particularly like about it is the way that it... Is it working again? Okay. <laughs> Uh, what I particularly find compelling about this book is the way that it can shift tones really quickly. It can go from dark to funny and back to dark again, from bizarre to funny and back to bizarre again. It's really a, 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 a kind of a whip whirling you around emotionally. And um, But what binds all the stories together is that they're all grounded in stories about relationships that are very relatable. So that he has this great talent of writing a story in a world that doesn't really exist, but you understand the relationships between these characters. Um, it's a great book if you like short stories. They're incredibly well crafted. He combines both the character development and the plot development together so that the stories really move quickly and you come to the end of the story and you have this big revelation like, oh, now I get what this was all about and it's a lot of fun. Um, so it is dark and it is odd, but it's also very funny and it's also very sort of exciting and new. Um, so yeah, strong recommend. So as opposed to new, this book was published in 1942. 20 Seconds of History, Anthony Boucher was the greatest history critic of all time. He was also a writer. He also co-founded Fantasy and Science Fiction Magazine back in the 40s, 50s, something like that. This book is based on a collection of his friends that had a writing group in California. Oh, phooey. I just told him it was okay. <laughs> in California in the 1930s and 40s. Uh, the characters in the book are based on people like Robert Heinlein, John W. Campbell, the greatest editor of science fiction ever, and also O. Ron Hubbard, who created Dianetics but wasn't always that crazy. <laughs> he, so to speak. The book is a locked room mystery. The characters in the book have a great time. At one point, one of the characters who's based on Heinlein actually proposes a fourth dimension from which the killer could have phased in, <laughs> committed the murder, and then phased back out. He does it with a straight face. The detective is actually uh, 
a police detective named Terrence, um, I forget his last name, but the main detective is done by a nun named Sister Ursula, who was delightful. Uh, Boucher had a series of books featuring her as the detective, and they're all terrific. I'm particularly fond of this one because of the science fiction connotations. The Heart's Invisible Furies by John Boyne. This is a wonderfully epic story set in Dublin that follows a young boy, Cyril Avery, who's an orphan, from womb to old age. I mean, he's not an orphan yet when he's in the womb, but soon. Um, <laughs> the rest of the time, he's an orphan. Starting in the late 1940s, it's a beautiful book look at identity, both Cyril's and Ireland's and a study on belonging and love in a world where those things can be so elusive to so many. Uh, this book has warmth and humor, as well as poignancy and tragedy, but the author walks this great line of hope and yearning very skillfully. Uh, you just, your heart is warmed throughout this book. Um, I gobbled it up quickly, and um, everybody I've recommended to has loved it. And it's just, by the end of it, you're just like, oh, Cyril, my heart. <laughs> um, you just don't want it to end. I love that there are young adult books on this list, and this, I'm happy to say, is one of them. Once in the Future is by Amy Rose, Capetta, and Corey McCarthy, who are a couple who live in town. They're both VCFA grads. It's a science fiction retelling of King Arthur set, obviously, in the future. The main character is named Ari Helix. She actually is a stowaway on a ship who meets eventually Guinevere, falls in love with her, uh, and Merlin, who has been aging backwards due to a really unfortunate spell, <laughs> a appears in the book as a teenager, about 14, maybe, maybe 15, something like that, desperate to find a King Arthur that will actually break the curse before he reverts back any further in age. Uh, the book's super fun, super, super funny. I love it to pieces. Uh, there's a love story between Ari and Guinevere. There's a love story of sorts between Merlin and a, and a knight named Val. And I recommend it highly. Uh, Trust Exercise by Susan Choi. Uh, this book starts out ostensibly as a novel about a teenage drama at a performing arts high school. But it turns into a very dramatic story of how our past ripples through our lives in ways we don't even realize. Uh, I felt like I was reading uh, this book, I was reading a master class in creative writing. Uh, it's got a very original and unexpected storytelling style that I can't really explain to you. You just have to, you have to experience for yourself. It's not weird, it's not out there, it's just original. Um, there are twists and turns in this book that will stop you cold because of the change in story, but also for the creative manner in which they are presented. I was very engrossed in this at all times. Uh, Choi creates a precise sense of place in characters whose every raw emotion is felt by the reader. I've always been a big fan of Susan Choi's, but this is by far my favorite of her novels. Okay, The Last Pirate of New York. Um, this is a great book if you are interested in history. Um, and also it falls into true crime and biography as well. Um, so it's about a man named Albert Hicks who was the last person to be convicted of piracy and it tells his story and the various horrible things that he did. But what's so exciting for me as a fan of history is that it gives this amazingly uh, a com complete view of New York City on the cusp of the Civil War. The uh, tenements and the docks where people were Shanghai and just the, the Irish immigrants coming and conflicting with the uh, affluent people living uptown and all this stuff. It's, it's a really uh, complex view of what America was like at this point where it was about to explode, and it's really fun to read for that reason. Hi, I get to talk. Mine are all further in the alphabet, apparently. Um, so this is Game of Kings by Dorothy Dennett, which was written in the 60s and is one of my favorite swashbuckling adventure stories. It's 1547 in Scotland, and the outlaw and rebel Francis Crawford of Lyman has secretly returned to his homeland. In the first 30 pages of the book, he swims across a river in the middle of the night, breaks into a house via the pigsty, floods Edinburgh's wells with claret, 
breaks into his own ancestral castle and steals the jewelry belonging to the large group of women visiting his mother, and then sets fire to the castle on his way out, all with great flair and many quotations of romantic poetry. Crawford may seem morally dubious, but his ultimate motivation is his loyalty to his family and his country, and he forms a mercenary army, risking his life to protect Scotland and its very young queen from the English troops heading north. Crawford always reminds me of a cross between Robin Hood, Lord Peter Whimsey, and the Scarlet Pimpernel. <laughs> Dorothy Dunnett's grasp of the history and literature of the 16th century, along with her sense of humor, make this a rich reading experience. And there are five sequels. Next book, Wine Lover's Daughter. Clifton Fadiman was born in Brooklyn to Ukrainian Jewish parents. As a boy, he shared a bed with his two brothers and worked in his father's unsuccessful drugstore. When he was four, he learned to read, and thereafter supplemented his school education with books he chose himself, falling in love with words in the process. He graduated from high school at 15 and enrolled at Columbia thereafter and proceeded to distance himself as far as possible from his humble beginnings. At 28, he was editor-in-chief at Simon & Schuster. At 29, he was the book critic at the New Yorker magazine. And he called Gertrude Stein a master in the art of making nothing happen very slowly. <laughs> and at 34, he was the MC of an NBC radio quiz show with 15 million listeners. He had tenaciously become as cultured as he could, and the wine that he drank, collected, and wrote about was a big part of that. Anne Fadiman gives us an affectionate and moving picture of her father that is clear-eyed, not denying his flaws and insecurities, but written with warmth and understanding and love. Oh, <laughs> I'm super delighted to talk about this book. It is called Yes, I'm Hot in This. It's actually this big. And it is a collection of cartoons that started out online and has not been published in book forms. It's by a woman who was born in the very foreign country of Michigan. <laughs> And sort of the questions that she gets from mostly well-meaning people who know nothing about her background but assume, because her skin is of a different color and she wears a hijab, that she's obviously from some faraway place like Iran or Iraq or some Arab country somewhere nobody really knows. Uh, it's hysterically funny, it is super pointed, and it's really worth reading at least twice, which I have. <laughs> So I went home last night thinking he was going to make notes on the books. What I ended up doing is rereading Riding the Elephant by Craig Ferguson instead. So Ferguson was the um, on the late show for 10 years. I don't know if you stayed up that late, but I did every night. It was, he's brilliant. He's Scott. He's very funny. He is incredibly profane, especially in print. It's delightful. <laughs> and I have an essay that I'm going to read a piece of. Don't worry, Grace. It's like 30 seconds, maybe. Let's <laughs> worry. <laughs> And I'm not going to mind it. I found a not, uh, this is about the first time he ever flew on his own. I found a small non powered airstrip nearby and contacted a flight instructor in Minneapolis. After jutting into the big airport as a customer, I crossed from the main terminal to the general aviation buildings on the opposite side. This was before he yelled, so there's nothing really to recommend Bob to me other than I like the sound of his voice on the phone. He was satisfyingly, satisfyingly piloty. He was big, mustachioed, grumpy, Wilford Brimley Republican who smelled like a wet dog. I felt safe getting into the plane with him, and indeed he knew the terrain like the back of his hand. Like most pilots, he was a much nicer and happier person once we were airborne. <laughs> the underneath. Melanie Flynn is a Vermont author you've probably never heard of, but extremely talented, so I suggest you find out about her by reading her book, The Underneath. Um, this is a gripping story that takes place in the Northeast Kingdom when Kay, a British investigative journalist who's traveled all over some dangerous places in Africa and all over the world, she arrives with her husband and two children to spend the summer in the bucolic Northeast Kingdom town and unplug and reconnect and do all that good stuff people have come to Vermont for. Um, shortly thereafter, her husband leaves on assignment and she's left alone. 
and she's rambling around this old house, and natural curious curiosity leads her to wonder where the owners of her rental cottage have disappeared to, as there are various clues about the house that lead her to suspect that something went wrong. Um, soon, Kay is immersed in this gritty and sometimes sinister world of poor rural Vermont. Uh, interspersed with background from Kay's journalistic work in Africa, this is a stunning examination of violence, both personal and political, and a thrilling look at the dark side of family, salvation, and the choices people make. Finn is a recent transplant to the United, to the Northeast Kingdom herself. Okay, uh, bingo love. This is a very short and sweet book. Um, it's colorful, it's bright, it's uplifting, it's a, a familiar story in a lot of ways. It's a story of love lost and love regained later in life as people who fell in love as teenagers get separated by forces beyond their control and then find themselves again as adults. Uh, but what makes it a little different from other telling of stories like this is that it's a graphic novel, so it's comic book style, and it's also uh, a lesbian couple, so it has a bit more of a modern take in that way. Um, but it's a, it's a great, if you have, don't read graphic novels, this is kind of a fun way to get into it. it. Like I said, it's short and sweet. The art isn't distracting in any way. The characters are well developed and they seem very real, and it's just an uplifting and nice story. So... Good night, stranger, Micaiah Bay Gold. Micaiah is a VCSA, VCFA teacher. Uh, you may know where she works up there. This is her first novel. It is a fabulous, fabulous novel. This is probably the best written book I've read this year, and I read a fair amount. It's set in Cape Cod. The main character is a woman named Lucy, who is part of a set of triplets, one of whom has died at a very young age. She also takes care of her brother. Uh, a person purporting to be the lost triplet shows up on the island and becomes uh, involved with the two of them and with other people on the island as well. So it's about family, it's about how much can we believe that someone actually exists? Are we willing to go that far to believe they exist? It's suspenseful, it's gloriously well written, and it's one of my favorite books of the year. Okay, uh, The Law of the Hills, A Judicial History of Vermont. And if that title doesn't stir excitement in you, uh, I'm very happy to report that it's much more interesting than it seems. Um, so uh, I, um, I love to read about Vermont history, and I love this book for two reasons. First, it gives these great stories of all the lawyers and judges who have had impact on Vermont's history. And they're all surprisingly colorful characters. And there's cantankerous ones who nobody liked. And there's the ones who everybody fawned over and thought, you know, this was my great mentor and all these great stories like that. It's also a really interesting way to understand Vermont history because the author is specifically looking at the judicial history, but he's, he's tying the whole history of the state through that. And that's something I've never considered before, not knowing anything about judicial history. So it's a totally different way to understand the state. And um, yeah, strong recommend. Feast Your Eyes by Myla Goldberg. Um, Myla Goldberg has written a deliciously evocative story about Lily Preston, who is a Sally Mann like fictional New York City photographer in the 50s and 60s. Lily was a single woman in New York trying to break into the art world and became a single mother. Both of these things were big strikes against her. The story is told through catalog notes written by her daughter for a posthumous MoMA exhibit of her work in the present day. Amazingly, Goldberg manages to bring alive the genius of Lily's phot photographs for the reader without ever showing us a single picture, which is a real testament to her creative writing. Uh, the characters of Lily and her daughter Samantha feel almost like a gift from the author. They're two strong yet flawed female characters whose tight mother-daughter bond is tested throughout their lives. This is absolutely one of my favorite books of the year. I've been trying to get everybody to read it. Um, I got my book group to read it. Everybody loved it. Um, and the writing is just brilliant. It's just really what she's done is, is amazing and uh, I definitely recommend it. Okay, uh, Gods with a Little G. Um, I will fully admit that I'm generally skeptical of books that have a teenager as the protagonist. I usually find teenagers 
protagonist either annoying or not very believably written. But this character, her name is Helen. Uh, she is believably written, and she is incredibly likable. So yay for that. Um, the story is about um, this girl who has uh, lost her mother as a child, and she's growing up with her deeply depressed father in a town that is fundamentally religious. So they've kicked out anybody who doesn't adhere with their beliefs. And naturally, she's a teenager, so she's rebelling against this in her own kind of quiet ways. And she's trying to figure out um, the usual thing that teenagers are trying to figure out, love and relationships. And she's also just trying to figure out the world that's beyond her that she can't reach because she's in this very restrictive town. It's fast-paced. It's funny. It's very sad at times, but it's always uplifting. Uh, very good. Woman at a Thousand Degrees by Halvor Helgeson. Here's how this book begins. I live here alone in a garage, together with a laptop computer and an old hand grenade. It's pretty cozy. <laughs> so begins this dark comedy narrated by Hera, an 80-year-old Icelandic woman who has lived a very fall, almost two fall, life that spanned much of the 20th century. Her story flashes back to tell us how she uh, became separated from her parents on the European continent during World War II and spent most of the war wandering around by herself, um, and about her post-war years as a socialite and the granddaughter of Iceland's first president, and what finally brought her to this garage in suburban Reykjavik, where she's so cozy. Um, Hera has a very unique perspective, a sharp tongue, worse than grace, and, <laughs> and um, she has a very original story to tell, and it was thoroughly entertaining, funny, and she's just got this acerbic wit. She's the kind of character you'd love to have a drink with, but you didn't really want her in your family or anything, because that could be rough. Like <laughs> 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 Blazing World by Siri Pusta. Um, this is again a book about a female artist. This is just a coincidence that I have <laughs> only read books about female artists, but um, also in New York City. She's a middle-aged woman, uh, more current day, and um, it's very different than the last book I recommended. It's about Harriet Burden, who uh, is trying to make it as an artist in New York as well. And she feels that she's consistently being ignored by the critics who favor younger, hipper, and usually male artists. Uh, and she's kind of pissed about it, and she's fed up, and she, she just decides to try an experiment. She hires three different men, younger for the most part, to present her work as their own and see what happens. And what unfolds is not what she expected at all. It's not what you expect at all. <laughs> the story is told from many different perspectives, her daughter, the men, uh, different people in, the, in her world. And where the truth lies is always in question. Harriet is strong and angry character, but she's also needy and sympathetic and very memorable. I found this thought provoking and um, definitely is a good book group recommendation because there's a lot to discuss and it's a, just a good needy book. Touchstone by Laurie R. King. Harris Stuyvesant is an agent working for the United States Bureau of Investigation in 1926, so this is before the FBI. He has come to London following clues to a series of mysterious bombings that have happened on U.S. soil. Harris is introduced to Captain Bennett Gray, a veteran who came back from the Great War with shell shock and an uncanny ability to sense people's hidden motivations. Bennett takes Harris along to a weekend house party hosted by a wealthy family with eccentric ideas, a party that seems to have subtle political undercurrents that may just tie into Harris's investigation. Add in two charismatic and intelligent women, a sadistic, manipulative government man who hopes to use Bennett's abilities for his own ends, slowly mounting tension, and lots of gin, and you have a recipe for a thriller I couldn't put down. The Other Americans by Leila Lalami. Uh, Driss is a Moroccan immigrant living in California, and on his way home from work one night, he's, hit, he's killed by a hit and run driver. The book is told from the perspective of his daughter, Nora, and after his death, while the family is grieving. And it examines the repercussions of his death that it has on his family, as well as others in his community. The witness to, a witness to the accident who's reluctant to come forward, a detective investigating the case, a, a neighbor, and more. All these characters come from different races, religions, 
and economic classes, and they all tell a very American story. This is a, a, that of the struggles of a Muslim American since 9-11 and of a universal family dynamics. It's very interesting insight into a slice of American life, and these people represent the other Americans, the ones that populate our whole country that, that you don't necessarily hear about all the time, and they're very heartfelt stories. So I think if you know me at all, you know that I'm a fan of mysteries. And I think the big test of mysteries is if you want to reread them. And I'm happy to report that Kristen and Bianca's books, I have now reread once a piece. There are three books in the series. The newest one is called The Stories You Tell. And it's about a private eye in Columbus, Ohio, named Roxanne Weary, which is a great private eye name. Uh, and this one she's called by her brother because her brother is in trouble, which is not the first time he's been in trouble. He's a minor and popular, uh, a daily unemployed post-college grad, you know the story. Uh, and the woman has come to visit him and has then vanished. From there, she starts investigating. She actually goes into online identities a lot. There's a lot of online stuff in here, which is fascinating because that's certainly topical. But the thing is that she's a terrific writer and a very good plotter. The, the mystery itself is fairly crude, and I was completely uh, bamboozled as to who had actually done it. Um, I recommend the series really enthusiastically. Uh, this America by Joe Lepore. Um, if anybody tackled Joe Lepore's 700 plus page history of America last year called These Truths, this is the perfect follow up. Um, so in this one, she's focusing on uh, political history and how the act of writing histories and telling the history of the nation plays into that. And um, for anybody who appreciates Joe Lepore's writing in The New Yorker, this is an excellent uh, uh, venue for that. Um, she's a fantastic writer. She keeps things very short and precise. Uh, and um, she, uh, and this one's her, probably her most politically engaged book, which is very exciting. Um, she's looking at the landscape of politics right now as we speak, and she's saying, you know, why, why is there nationalism rising in this country? And she's putting together a really fascinating argument that we're telling our history wrong, and that people are being misled into nationalism because of that. And it's a very exciting book in, in sort of the, the strength of her argument against it. Um, she's, I think, one of the best writers I think right now. Okay, uh, The Queen by Joyce Levin. Um, so this is a book about um, uh, a woman named Linda Taylor, who was dubbed the welfare queen by politicians in the press who discovered her, um, 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 sorry, who discovered that she was cheating welfare and uh, living rather luxuriously off of that. Um, and it tells her actual true story, her full story. And her full story is way wilder than that. Um, she was much more of a criminal than that. I mean, she was involved in lots, lots more serious things than uh, welfare scams. Um, but it also, this book, while telling her story, also looks at sort of her legacy as a, a press figure, as somebody who uh, politicians pointed to as a, a reason for welfare reform and that sort of thing. So it, it's equal parts true crime and American history. It's fascinating. Uh, Barbara or Rebecca Mackay. Um, Rebecca Mackay is really well known right now for her big bestseller, The Great Believers. This is her first novel, which is kind of my favorite. It's about um, a children's librarian, so Grace approved, <laughs> named Lucy, who has a favorite young patron who's a 10 year old boy named Ian. And she kind of takes to Ian because he, she wants to save him from his overbearing mother who um, is very religious and won't let him choose his own books. She likes to censor what he reads and she sends him to anti-gay classes and you know, Lucy's just, her heart's gone out to this boy. And one day something happens and all of a sudden they decide to go on a road trip together. But she hasn't told his parents this so it's kind of like kidnapping, and a lot like kidnapping, but you know, with the best of intents. And, <laughs> and there's a lot of children's literature references woven into the storytelling, which is just delightful. And it's a lot of fun, and it's just a very engaging and funny and sweet story, and worth checking out. So we cheated twice on this. 
We're supposed to do one book at a time. I'm doing two books. We're not supposed to do bestsellers. They're both on the way. Bestseller list. The priest didn't notice, so I did. <laughs> These are both classic mysteries. Uh, they're both set for young adults, but that does not mean they're not accessible to people who like to read. Uh, the first book actually is a closed circle of suspects mystery set in a detention hall in high school about a kid who gets poisoned. It has to be one of five people who are in detention with him because there's a teacher there. And the entire rest of the book follows from that. The investigation, the suspects, um, the town sort of torn apart. Is it the bad kid from the other side of the tracks that is in detention? Of course it probably is because it's always the bad kid, right? Uh, the ending is completely unexpected. The characters are what you will come back for because the characters are fabulous in the book. Anthony Boucher, who published another book in 1942, could have written this if he had gone to high school in the early 2000s. It's remarkably good. The second book, actually, is set in Vermont. It's called Two of Us. Can Keep a Secret. Can Keep a Secret. Thank you, Cora. <laughs> and it's about uh, a set of twins who come back to stay with their grandma at a town that is just outside an old amusement park where murders happened uh, one 20 years ago, one five years ago. They become involved in the investigation for that. Uh, again, there's a lot of great characterization. There's a lot of really good plotting, and I was completely fooled by the end. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy to say that hopefully we're getting her to come up to visit Barapon sometime. So this is one of George's favorites, too. Told me I had to do it, right? Red, white, and royal blue. Alex Claremont Diaz is the 20-year-old son of the first female president of the United States. And he is a media darling, handsome and ambitious, with the aim of becoming the youngest person ever elected to Congress. He has had a long-standing, unspoken rivalry with England's younger prince, Henry. And at the wedding of Henry's older brother, the Prince of Wales, they cause a scandal by ruining the wedding cake, which cost $75,000 <laughs> during an altercation. As a consequence, and in order to avoid destabilizing the relationship between the two countries on the eve of his mother's re-election campaign, they are required to pretend they have been close personal friends for the past several years. They're made to uh, attend charity events together and do TV interviews where they have lots of smiling, true gritted teeth. But as they get to know each other, they discover that not only are they more compatible than they thought, but that they might even be falling in love. This is a very sweet and heartfelt fairy tale romance with a healthy dose of real world problems. OK, Bizarre Romance by Audrey Niffinger and Betty Campbell. Um, so uh, Audrey Niffinger wrote a major bestseller with The Time Traveler's Wife a number of years ago. And um, since then, she's gone more and more into the graphic novels uh, format, which is really interesting. And Eddie Campbell happens to be her husband, who is an illustrator. So they work together on this book. It's 13 stories about love, and at times they're very bizarre. Um, if you are, um, if you're not familiar with any graphic novels and you're not interested in sort of the comic style, panel by panel, this might be more interesting because the art style is all over the place. The way that Eddie Campbell incorporates art into these stories is very creative and very different story to story. And in addition to that, there's just a lot of prose. There's just actual paragraphs in this, too. So that's nice. Um, and uh, this book is very surprising. It's unlike anything I've ever read before. And um, I, I, I don't really want to give too much away. <laughs> the Rook. This is a wacky book. Uh, Miffity Thomas wakes up in a London park surrounded by a ring of dead people wearing latex gloves. She has no memory of who she is or how she got there. In her pocket, she finds a letter from herself informing her that she is in danger and needs to get to a safe place immediately. She eventually discovers that she works in the upper echelons of an organization called the Chucky Group, kind of a secret service of the supernatural. Thanks to a binder full of information she had thoughtfully left to herself, she slowly finds her footing in her job, getting to know her coworkers, including one whose mind occupies four nearly identical bodies, feeling out the limits of her own supernatural abilities and gradually uncovering the vast conspiracy threatening to take down the entire organization from within. This is one of the weirdest and funniest books I have ever read.
So Dementia Reimagined by Tia Powell is neither weird nor funny. It kind of broke my heart, actually. It's a survey of dementia, which was around back in Roman times. Um, I read this from the bookstore shortly after my parents died, both of whom had dementia. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a fascinating history. I found out so much stuff I hadn't known before. Uh, it's also a really moving personal story of her relationships with her grandmother and mother who both had dementia. Uh, it's also, and this is the uplifting part that will make your heart break in a different way, the last couple of chapters she writes about what she will be like if she gets dementia and how best we can, we can help her have it and carry on. Mm -hmm. It's lovely. It talks about music. It talks about companionship. It's, it, it talks about love in a lot of ways. It's, it's a really wonderful book. The World As It Is by Ben Rhodes. This is one of my husband's favorite books as well as one of mine. And he, he helped me with this review. I have read a lot of Obama-related memoirs. Pretty um, much but... everyone that came out. <laughs> um, if I had to choose only one to tell you to read, this is it. Um, at least until Obama writes his own. Uh, ben Rhodes served first as a speechwriter, then as Deputy National Security Advisor, and was in the room for so many pivotal moments. And he not only understood the implications of everything that happened, but he helps us to understand them as well. In clear and measured prose that acts as a great antidote to today's rhetoric. He gives us an intimate picture of Obama and all his fierce intelligence and responsibility, words that can be used to describe Rhodes as well. He, it is reassuring to know that there were and hopefully are people like that working for the best interests of the country and for democracy globally. And reading this book gave me hope for the future. Okay, uh, Read People in Vermont, The Paradox of Development in the 20th Century by Paul Searles. So Paul Searles is a history professor at Linden State, and about 15 years ago he wrote a book called Two Vermonts, which delved deeply into 19th century Vermont politics. And uh, this book is a follow-up to that, and rather than look at what was happening at the State House, he look, goes to Land Grove, Vermont, and he looks specifically at two families from the 19th century who lived there, and how their lives were impacted by the policies that were set at the state level. And um, Land Grove being one of the various tiny towns in Vermont, uh, these were people who were impacted by efforts to revitalize, um, the uh, rural Vermont, efforts to make the economy come back to life, efforts to keep people in rural Vermont, since that has been a problem for a long time now. Um, it's a really fascinating story, and it's um, because he uses these actual people and their stories to um, look at policy, it makes the policy uh, a lot more interesting to understand. And it also paints, you know, we're still having these conversations today, and it paints them in a totally different light now that you, now after I read it, after I read realized how long these conversations have been going on for. The Driver's Seat is um, a very short novel, a very quick pace, so you can get through it probably in one sitting if you want to. Um, it's set in London in the 70s, and it's the story of Lise, a dour woman who's sick of her life and is heading to Italy on holiday. You see from the start that Lise is kind of an odd character, and you know something bad is going to happen. Uh, they let you know that right up front. But what does happen takes some, the story takes some unexpected dark turns um, that kind of keep you guessing um, right all the way through. It's an older book, but I think everybody should read Muriel Spark at least <laughs> one time in their life. And this is such a masterpiece in a small package that this is a great place to start. George Takei's book, They Call This Enemy, which I am in the place. Uh, is also a graphic memoir. I'm really tickled that we've done so many books on graphics with this thing. That's, that's great. Uh, this is a memoir of his time in the internment camp in World War II with his mom and dad and his brother. It also talks about his experiences growing up. It talks about as well what it was like to be a kid living in a place where he didn't actually know that he was essentially in jail, which he was. Um, when, in, in 2017, on the 75th anniversary of FDR's signing the act that, that called for internment, Takei was invited to speak at the FDR library about his experiences. And that's how the book concludes, is just him talking about that and what it was like 
Um, there you meet people in the book that are wonderful, that, that were completely involved in the community, that had no reason to be other than they felt what was happening is wrong. And one of the obvious things that you can take from this is how relevant this job is today. Brad Farrar by Josephine Tay. Uh, Josephine Tay is not as well known as Agatha Christie or Dorothy Sayers, but uh, along with those two, I think they're the top three writers, uh, the golden age of detective fiction. And this book is one of her best. When the Ashby children were young and their parents were both killed in an accident, and shortly afterwards, the oldest boy, Patrick, who was 13, disappeared, leaving what might have been a suicide note or just an apology for running away. It's unclear. Eight years later, a young man named Brat Farrar, an orphan recently returned to England from the States, is stopped on the street by an old friend of the Ashby's and is drawn into a scheme to pretend to be Patrick. Um, and because he looks exactly like Patrick's surviving twin, who is about to inherit the Ashby estate. Um, he has been well coached, and the family seems to accept him after some initial shock. Uh, the more Brad learns about the boy that he's impersonating, the more he feels kinship with him and even some protectiveness towards him. He also begins to suspect that all is not as it seems within the family, and a sense of tension and eventually even menace gradually permeates the story until you find yourself reading the last 50 pages in a great rush, like falling down a hill. Uh, semicolon. Yeah. Uh, so this is a history of the semicolon. And, um, what I really loved about this book is as someone who has attempted over the years to read uh, English grammar books and try to figure out how to become a good writer and that sort of thing, I could never really, it always seemed um, arbitrary at some point. It always seemed like, who's making up these ideas? And this book, it follows the history of the semicolon, and in the process, it goes through all these different grammar rules that people had made over the years, and it shows just how arbitrary it really is. Um, so this is really well written, not surprisingly, for someone who wanted to write about punctuation, and it's fun, and it's fast, and it's totally fascinating. Code name Verity. This is ostensibly a young adult book, but there really is no reason that it's young adult rather than anyone. Um, there are so many novels about World War II, but this is my personal favorite. It's about two young British women who are best friends. One of them, Maddie, is a pilot who flies for the air transport auxiliary. So she ferries planes from one air base to another or you know, to be fixed or takes them to the pilots who are going to fly uh, missions. The other woman is Julie, who is recruited by the special operations executive to work as a spy in France because of her facility with French and German. She's captured shortly after landing in France. She looks the wrong way to cross the road, which actually apparently really happened to somebody. Um, and the first half of the book is told from her perspective as she writes reports on her mission for the Germans who've captured her. Eventually, you realize that she is stringing them along. She's subtly changing and inventing information to mislead them. The second half of the book is told by Maddie, who in a moment of crisis ends up flying to France and crashing her plane, and has to pose as the cousin of a local farm family as she gets drawn into helping the resistance while she searches for Julie. I've read this book three or four times now, and it still makes me cry like a baby every single time. <laughs> Connie Willis is my favorite author of, of fantasy and science fiction. To Say Nothing of the Dog is her funniest book. Ned Henry desperately needs a rest. He's been shuttling back and forth between 2057 and the 1940s on a search mission assigned by Lady Shrapnel, a wealthy and eccentric Oxford University patron, trying to find something called the Bishop's Bird Stump, which was lost in the Nazi air raid on Coventry Cathedral. Ned has developed time lag from too many trips back and forth. Symptoms include maudlin sentimentality, difficulty in distinguishing sounds, irritability and susceptibility to falling in love. To hide from the relentless Lady Shrapnel and to recover from the time lag, he is sent to the summer of 1889 in the Oxford countryside, which is supposed to be restful, but where he encounters a mystery related to the Bishop's bird stump, along with eccentric Oxford dons, seances with a fraudulent medium named Madame Iratotsky, a butler who is hiding something, and a bulldog named Cyril. This book is completely chaotic and absolutely hilarious. And last but definitely, definitely not least, this book came out yesterday. I've been grabbing people by the lapels, telling them they have to read it. 
Um, Frank Lee is a Korean American high school senior in Southern California who struggles with his place in the world. He feels like he isn't Korean enough for his parents or American enough for everyone else. Um, he and his best friend Q, who's African American, are smart and nerdy kids. They're doing well in school and trying to, trying to get a perfect score on the SATs. They like to play video games and they talk to each other like old-fashioned British gentlemen and say, pip pip, old chap, my good man. <laughs> Frank's parents expect him to end up with a nice Korean girl, but he has fallen for a girl named Brit, who is white. Frank makes a plan with his friend, Joy Song, who is also Korean American. Uh, Joy is secretly dating a Chinese boy against her parents' wishes, and she and Frank decide to pretend to date each other so that they can get their parents off their backs. Of course, things don't go quite as they planned. Um, and Frank starts to realize that there may be things he didn't know about his own life and his family and his parents his father in particular. This book is so honest and engaging and moving and is the best thing I've read so far this year. Mm -hmm. um, we will take questions, but there were two, two this many things that I forgot to say before. And the first one is that this, um, the idea for this program actually came from Nancy Graff, who was sitting over there. Yay, Nancy. <laughs> and um, if we get good feedback, um, we may do it every year. We'll, we'll see if you know if something that you really enjoy. And the other thing is that all of the books on the list are either available at the bookstore or in the library, or both. Or George is our new interlibrary loan librarian at the library. If it's something that you can't get, George will be happy to get it for you. So I, I'm sorry to have cut off questions earlier on, but if, if you made notes, please ask any of the four or all. Go ahead, ask. I may really do dishes again. <laughs> What's more important, reading or dishes? Yes. George, the question I had for you before is rock to the floor. You said it was voucher. The book cover shows that he had a uh, Anthony Voucher book? Yes. Yeah. Uh, Anthony, Anthony Voucher was his pseudonym. His name is actually William Anthony Parker White or something like that. But it's a retired old library. Where is it at? It would be under Voucher <laughs> as, soon as, we, as soon as we buy it. <laughs> What was the question that I cut off early on? Did that, that, was you know, that was yours. Okay. Well, that was relevant. <laughs> we have a question here. Not a question, but just a sincere thank you. This is just the one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you all very, very much. Yeah. Here, here. Would, you, would you be willing to have. Oh, go on to Diane. Sorry. Might, might we do one uh, of the favorite books we've read? And our life, like with the kids and all that kind of stuff. Would you like that? Yeah. So, children's yeah. books? No, well, not necessarily. Just books like Ajinsky's biography or Anne Frank's diary or something that you read at some point in your life, usually when you're older, when you're younger. You know, you're older. Something that made a big impression. And you really always remembered it and had some different stuff all the time. That's interesting. You know what I, what I would love you to do is if you would all highlight a couple of books a piece maybe that were really good book group books. A couple of you said that as you were going along, but I'm going to have my scribe take notes here. Personal <laughs> sister. <laughs> you know, something that would, is really good discussion. Yes? I Are they going to answer your question first? I don't know. You're going to ask my question. What are your parameters? Do they need to be out of paperback currently? Yes. Yes. Okay. Provided, yeah. Out of paperback, something that's um, got a lot to discuss about it. Yeah, the couple that I talked about that I would think would be good book club books are the Ben Rhodes book, The World As It Is, um, and maybe the Ann Fadiman book about her father. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'd say, um, well, I feel like any of mine would be good for my career, actually. But The Feast Your Eyes by Myla Goldberg, Hearts Invisible Furies by John Boyne, um, maybe The Underneath 
by Melanie Finn, particularly, okay. and all the others that I mentioned. All the other ones. <laughs> <laughs> you want us to talk about Justice of the Hills, right? Or whatever it was. Yes. Um, <laughs> yeah. And uh, the uh, Paul Searle's Repeopling Vermont um, is simultaneously a fascinating picture of 19th century Vermont, and it also, because it tells these two family stories, it, it's uh, uh, um, it's not just a regular history in that sense. It's when it comes out in paperback, Dementia Reimagined by Tia Powell, mm -hmm. and that'll be a while because it's like a year. It'll be a year from now, probably. <laughs> Um, and the Mackay Bay Gold novel, which was fabulous. Good Night Stranger. I read that and loved it too. Yeah, still in hardcover though. Right, Eventually which just came out too. Yeah. Okay, other questions? Sorry, yes. Uh, I wonder if, you, if someone wants to address this whole idea about young adult novels becoming more you know, popular with us old adults, you know, old mm -hmm. adults and the difference in terms of reading them, or how did, do they feel differently? I don't think I've ever read anything that was called young adult, and I just wonder what the how what the parameters are. I think really the only difference is that they're written with young people in mind and told from the perspective of young people. Okay. Yeah. And other than that, there's no reason those of us who are older can't read them. I, I think the main thing is the protagonist for young adult literature is usually a young adult. Okay. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and young adult by that, Anne Frank would be young adult literature. I noticed the pretty high percentage of graphic and some fantasy. It's fine with me. Is it a hard or easy sell with your buyers? Easy. Easy. Yeah. Although we can't get Mystery Club to do it. <laughs> What was that in the that? Oh, I said, although I think in Mystery Club, you do graphic oh, oh, oh. Okay, anything else? That was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.